Josh, we had a poll up earlier about Jason Kelsey. What's the status of that poll on whether or not people think he should come back as the Eagles center next year? So we're at 36 votes so far. 81% say yes, need a new center. 19% said no, he's the best option. And, of course, uh, Pete, you brought up a little bit to me during the break that uh, the Eagles have signed uh, guard tackle Dallas Thomas to a f- reserve futures contract, the 2013 third round draft pick by the Dolphins started 26 games for Miami. So we'll bring John McMullen into the conversation. John, how you doing today? Doing well, guys. How are you? Good, John. Doing pretty good. So it seems like, you know, with the Eagles, a lot of the conversation yesterday was about Kelsey. You know, today, obviously, Jimmy Kevsky came out with his report that they're considering cutting Ryan Matthews, which... I think a lot of people like yourself had already, you know, proposed even before the season even ended. Um, you know, looking overall at the Eagles, you know, a lot of people in the area seem to be down on Jason Kelsey. Do you think that even if it's not Sayamalu, that Jason Kelsey is still a good viable option as an NFL center, considering the fact of how much he's paid? Well, that's the problem. He hasn't. Uh, played up to his contract really for the past two years. Uh, you know, I think he's the 10th highest paid center in football. Uh, as I wrote uh, on my piece on 973ESPN.com, he's rated the 27th uh, best center. And as I point out, he's really 28 because one of them uh, moved to guard late in the season and pro football focus rated him there. So If you think about it, there's 32 teams and you have the 28th best center uh, and you're paying them like a top 10 center, well, that's an issue. And that's what the Eagles are contemplating. And and the fact that they believe the best position for Isaac Sayamalu long-term is the center position, that's what they feel. Uh, Then you start to think about maybe it's time to move on uh, if you can't restructure a deal of that nature, or you simply think Sayamalo would be an upgrade. Uh, and those sort of tea leaves started early in the season when you started to hear the whispers that Sayamalo was looking really good and they projected him at center. I think that was the start of all this. And, uh, you know, the Eagles would love to get something in return and trade them. Uh, but I, I think it's leaning more, if I'm going 50-50, it's leaning more in the direction that Jason Kelsey's not back uh, for the 2017 season. John McMullen with us, our Eagles insider for 973ESPN.com. You can read his work on our website. And, John, I know you retweeted out today the tweet from the NFLPA talking about the Eagles carrying $7.933 million of cap money over from 2016 into 2017, how does that work, and where does that number put the Eagles in the scheme of things? Well, the Eagles don't have a ton of cap space to begin with. Uh, about 7.2, 7.3 million under the projected cap, which will be set in March, but it's going to be around 165 to 170. Uh, so if you put it at 168, uh, they don't have a ton of cap space. So that helps a little bit. But when you look at it as a, as a whole, compared to some other teams, Cleveland, for instance, has about $100 under the cap. San Francisco has about 80 Uh The Eagles don't start with a lot of cap space, but – Hey, you don't have to worry about Howie Roseman as far as contracts go. If they want a player, he'll create the space. And part of it is moving on from certain players. It might be Jason Kelsey. It would almost certainly be Ryan Matthews. Connor Barwin uh, is in that conversation. Even Jason Peters uh, is a possibility if he doesn't restructure his contract. So there's a lot of ways, and he's very inventive, so I never worry about that part of it uh, because that's the strength of Howie Roseman's game, so to speak, 
is juggling salary cap. So on paper, it doesn't look good, but don't worry about it. You mentioned a bunch of names there. Uh, uh, would um, Leotis McKelvin or Michael Kendricks, are they possible cap casualties as well? Yeah, they are. Uh, I, I think Leotis more than I, I think the Eagles know uh, they have to make a significant upgrade at that position. And that means bringing in a number of bodies, not just one. Uh, but they need multiple bodies at the cornerback position. Uh, and if they bring in the right people, uh, sure, you can move on uh, from Leotis McKelvin. But his contract is not really uh, that much of a, uh, a hamstring, and, and he's only got one more ye- year left on his deal. So I, I don't think it would hurt very much to bring him back. But if they think they've improved enough, and free agency in the draft at that particular position, yeah, they could move on because they know how much of an upgrade they need at the position, and the guys who played there this season just weren't good enough. Let's get back to Jason Peters for a minute as we talk with John McMullen, our Eagles insider for 97.3 ESPN. Uh, didn't Doug Peterson say that he wanted Jason to be back, and Peters also said that he wants to keep playing with Wentz? I mean, all th- those comments seem to indicate that they're going to bring him back, and yet he's on your list. Yeah, Doug wants him back, but remember, Doug's not in control of the roster, uh, and Jason makes is scheduled to make a lot of money. And at his age, uh, you sort of the mentality in the NFL is it's better to give up on a player a year early than a year late. So I think the Eagles do want him back. I think Doug Peterson certainly wants him back, but not at his salary cap number. They want to restructure his deal, and there's a lot of ways to get that done. But if he's not willing to do it, then he could move on. I think if he is willing to do it, he'll certainly be back, but it remains up in the air. We're talking with John McMullen on 97.3 ESPN.com. Eagles Insider also covers the NFL for Fan Rag Sports. Uh, John, a couple of news and items around the NFL. Uh, the, the coaching staffs are slowly starting to fill up. Greg Olson, who is the guy who was fired by the Jaguars, now is going to be the offensive coordinator for the Rams. So Sean McVay continuing to hire people to his staff who – are not just older than him in age, but also have a lot more experience than him. Yeah, that's a good idea as a first-time head coach. Uh, and certainly one that's that young uh, to have experienced guys uh, who have been through all the wars. Uh, it's something similar that I said last season when Doug Peterson got this job. Uh, I thought it was a tremendous staff that he put together, uh, and to get veteran coordinators uh, was a very, very smart move uh, because you are going to struggle as a first-time head coach in this league, uh, and, and to get veteran guys that you can lean on uh, is always a smart decision. And, and when you talk about Sean McVay as the youngest NFL coach in history, uh, having a little experience at your side is, is certainly not going to hurt him. Speaking of new head coaches, Vance Joseph uh, has came out and said that he wants to run a high-paced, high-tempo, fast attacking offense with offense coordinator Mike McCoy. But wouldn't I contend, John, that that all sounds well and good, but you have two very young quarterbacks still who – yeah, they got a whole year of experience in the NFL under the belts, but they're not exactly, you know, elite level players. No, certainly not. Uh, I think, you know, one of the reasons, uh, sort of, besides the health issues with Gary Kubiak, which were the main reason, obviously, he moved on and retired, but there was some talk in Denver that. You know, Kubiak liked Trevor Simeon better. John Elway wanted to get, uh, wanted to move forward quicker with Paxton Lynch. 
uh, the first round pick from last season. And if you think about it, what did Paxton do with Memphis? Uh, sort of that typical spread, high paced offense we all see at the college level. And I think that's where that comes from. Uh, they want to get to the Paxton Lynch era as quickly as possible. And to do that, uh, he's, uh, he's very limited as far as what he did at the college level. Uh, so if you want to build up and you want to get hit to him as a starter, you got to sort of build around his strengths as a player. And I think that's where that mentality comes from. You know, in Denver overall, John, you know, I'm looking at that team. They definitely need to improve the offensive line. They need a little bit more depth of quality depth at running back. And of course, there were defensive deficiencies that came out. So, with the with the with the issues that they have with the cap, Denver has talking about the Eagles' cap issues, but Denver has its own set of cap issues. What do you expect to see from John Elway this off season? Well, yeah, you're right. I, I mean, Denver defensively, you can talk about their deficiencies, but if, if you look at their talent level. It's as good as anybody in football still. And it starts with, obviously, Von Miller. If he's not the best edge pass rusher in the league, he's one of the top two or three. And then you have two lockdown cornerbacks, and most teams would kill for one. So when you have that in place, you should be able to build a really, really good defense. But the concern is you had one of the best coordinators in history, and you moved him out uh, for Vance Joseph, and we'll see how that works out because there's going to be a, a ton of pressure on a defensive-minded head coach to keep things at the level they have been defensively. Uh, and our offense, you're right, but when you talk about the offense they want to run, people think that takes care of a lot of issues on the offensive line because they're not asked to do as much as a traditional NFL system. I don't like it. I don't agree with it. I don't think that's the right way to go. Uh, and you see the difference with teams that have really, really good offensive lines in this league. You saw it with Dallas and Green Bay. You saw it with Atlanta. We're probably the most Improved offensive line in, in football. I, I don't understand why teams are going in this direction, but more and more teams are. Another coaching move that made me scratch my head today, John, when I saw it. So Mike Vrabel is the new defensive coordinator in Houston, but Romeo Cornell is still there. He's going to be the assistant head coach. What, what's up? What's up with the coaching shuffle down in Houston? Well, I think that's one of those things where Mike Frabel is sort of a rising star in the profession, and they wanted to keep him. And the best way to keep him is to give him a promotion, obviously, uh, give him the defensive coordinator title, and you still have Romeo Cornell get kicked up to assistant head coach. So basically you have two guys working in concert, uh, and it was the number one defense in the NFL without J.J. Watt. And hopefully J.J. Watt's healthy and gets back. So you can imagine how good they would be there. Uh, I don't think that's as big as a deal as it may look on the surface. Uh, it's just basically about making a, a rising star in the coaching profession happy. And you still have Romeo Cornell and you still have a really good defensive coaching set. In the Bizarro News Department, Brandon Marshall has come out and said that he is underpaid at $7.5 million. I would say, John, that Brandon Marshall is also one of the leaders in the NFL in drops over the last two seasons. So is he underpaid or is he paid just right? Uh, it depends how you look at it. He's a talented guy, obviously. But if you look at Brandon Marshall's history, it's pretty clear he wears out his welcome no matter where he is. And a player that talented, similar to Terrell Owens back in his career, shouldn't be bouncing around from organization to organization. But you have a guy that continuously creates problems and might be 
in this case, contract related. In times it's been feuding with other players, in times it's been doing stupid things uh, in the media. Brandon Marshall has a shelf life, and I think it's coming to an end with the New York Jets. Uh, but he is, hey, he's a very, very talented receiver. You can't take that away from him. Uh, and and that comparison strikes me because that was T.O. T.O. was a tremendously talented receiver that always wore out his welcome, but he always dropped the football, too. People forget that. A lot of drops with Terrell Owens, a lot of drops with Brandon Marshall. You kind of overlook it, though, because of the volume and the big plays. Speaking of wide receivers, it is the week before Sunday's NFL championship game. We'll break down more of the matchups as Thursday and Friday come along. But some news coming out of the practices. No Devontae Adams at Packers practice. No Julio Jones at Falcons practice. Mike McCarthy and Dan Quinn both seem pretty positive about their receivers. But do you think, John, we'll see both of those receivers in the championship game on Sunday? Well, I think Devontae's more concerning than Julio Jones. This was Atlanta's plan. They announced it. Uh, he certainly wasn't going to practice on Wednesday, uh, but he's going to be good to go for the game. Uh, and we'll see about Devontae Adams. He got banged up against Dallas. And obviously, Jordy Nelson's not going to play, no matter what the Packers say. Uh, and as well as Aaron Rodgers is playing, and he's playing at a higher level than anybody has ever played at this position right now. You can't keep losing receivers week after week after week, even it's going to affect him at some point. I do expect Adams to be out there. question is how close to 100% is he going to be uh, because the Packers are going to have to outscore the Falcons to win that game because the Falcons are going to score a ton of points against that Green Bay defense. Another uh, injury report coming in. Uh, Jeremy Fowler of ESPN is reporting that Ladarius Green was a limited participant at practice today. He's been in that NFL concussion protocol, but he's no better than 50-50 right now. So do you, what do you think the odds are, John, positive or negative, that Ladarius Green plays on Sunday? And if he does play, how much could that possibly impact the game? Oh, uh, that's big for the Steelers, and they haven't had it. That, you know, if you think about what the Steelers haven't had the entire season with Martavis Bryant being suspended and Green dealing with all the concussions and injury issues, imagine if those two guys were on the field all season, how good that Steelers offense would be. Uh, yeah, he's a significant threat uh, down the seam, a much uh, bigger receiving threat than Jesse James. Uh, so that would be big for the Steelers, but you can't count on him. He's only played in a handful of games, and uh, I don't think Pittsburgh is, is you know, going to rely on it. But if he's out there, it certainly helps that offense because it's another big play threat. John McMullen with us, our Eagles insider for 97.3 ESPN and our NFL analyst for FanRag Sports. Dot com. Well, John, uh, Josh and I were talking about it, I think, as we came back, and uh, Lady Gaga says she wants to perform on the roof of NRG Stadium at the Super Bowl halftime show. Uh, let's do two parts. One, your favorite Super Bowl performer that you've already had or that's gone by, and two, who you think should be there. Well, you know, I don't have as big as a problem uh, I, I, you know, when Bruno Mars was there, I was there live, and the fans loved it. It's not my cup of tea. Uh, I prefer the legendary, you know, the Stones when they were there, even Prince when he was there, uh, the Who. But, you know, you got to be honest, Pete. I'm older than you. We're getting too old. So uh, the viewers, this generation would rather see Lady Gaga, and that's the way the NFL is going. I don't have a big problem with it. I understand it. Uh, but, yeah, certainly I'd prefer Bruce Springsteen and Lady Gaga. As long as they don't go back to up with people? Is, is that, uh, you know, or, or uh, <laughs> we, we saw a lot of references when Josh and I did that segment about the halftime shows to the Grambling State University Band. Yeah, 
Yeah, re- remember what you we- Again, I'm dating myself, but I can remember when the Super Bowl halftime show wasn't a big deal. So uh, that's that's not a good thing, uh, and it's created its own sort of almost a, a, another television show. It's such a big deal these days, uh, and it's just another example of the NFL uh, creating this juggernaut that it is as far as being an entertainment vehicle. John McBowen with us here on the Sports Bash on 97.3 ESPN. Joins us every time at this time in the 4 o'clock hour to talk all things Eagles and around the NFL as well. And he'll be back with us again tomorrow. Thanks, John. Appreciate it, buddy. Hey, thank you, 